The opioid epidemic, it affects everyone. It doesn't matter age, race, how much money you have. It doesn't matter how well educated you are. It affects everyone. And just as it does not discriminate, nor do we. We make sure that anyone and everyone that walks through that door feels safe and this just really deep, unconditional love. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you're doing. I don't care what behaviors are. I don't want to see you die. Our drug policy is so hooked into punitive measures. We need to come from this from a different angle. And harm reduction is an attempt to do that. This is Riley. How's it going, dude? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good to meet you. Yeah, um, take it out of that. Yep, go ahead and pour those. Excellent. So what size syringe do you prefer? Um, half cc our goal is to help you get to where you're using one, one time, putting it in here and bringing them back. We have different sizes of cookers. Mm -hmm. We have colored coated, so you can put a color with a substance or a color with a person to ensure that there's no sharing happening. We have a med room that's now open where we do HIV and hep C testing. Oh. I'm gonna give you some prep pads. This will massively, massively help um, decrease the possibility of any abscesses. All right, I'm also gonna give you two different kinds of tourniquets. Okay. Um, strongly encourage these. Tie off few inches above the injection site. Just be sure to take it off prior to injecting, okay? I'm putting in a bad batch alert, okay? So right now, there's a batch of boy or heroin um, but there's a whole lot of fentanyl in it. And this particular batch is purple. Can you see that? See how purple that is? Be really, really careful, okay? Thank you very much. It was really good to meet you, you and I hope we see you soon. Thank you very much. All right, buddy, have a good one. Is this your first time here? Yeah. Okay, cool, well, welcome. This is Access Point. After you use each syringe, you will we often get stigmatized. People love to focus on it because they believe that it's enabling. One thing that I've learned is that somebody not having access to clean syringes does not mean that they are not going to use. That is not the way that addiction works. And what happens is they use anyway, but they use in incredibly harmful ways. One of my favorite sayings is that dead people don't recover. We do enable people. We enable people to stay alive. I am transgender, female to male. What that means is I was born, raised, and socialized as female, in a female body, although I didn't connect with that. Puberty was hands down some of the hardest times of my life. I wanna be clear here, like it's not that it was confusing, it felt wrong. It felt wildly wrong. I did not want to be in my body or be in my body and be in this world. And it was very extreme, very fast. I began the IV drug use at 14. It began initially with meth and very quickly went to heroin. Eighth grade was the last grade I completed. I didn't go to high school. I did drugs. Riley was helping me and I asked him for to hand me a cord and he held out his arm and I could see the big bruises all over and I knew then I I knew he was doing drugs I had a good 
20 years of very intense chaotic drug use. I was selling drugs. I mean, it opened a can of worms. Institutions and prison and just some really hard years. Riley's struggle was a horrible thing to live through, to always worry that I was gonna get the phone call that he was dead. I distinctly remember him calling me and in his voice, I knew he was giving up. I knew it was like he was calling me for the last time. And I said, Riley, Riley, it's your job. You stay alive, you bury me. That's how it works. I had many years of passionately, like desperately wanting to stop using. I just had this really deep feeling of hopelessness. Honestly, there's just no way that he would be alive today without methadone and medically assisted treatment. Medication assisted treatment has been my saving grace, or at least the root that my recovery has grown out of, absolutely saved my life. I didn't think that I could do anything besides labor. So, you know, I mowed lawns and I did landscaping. Within a year or two, I had a truck and a trailer and people knew I was the guy who hired people in recovery. I lead other people and people supported it. But what really happened was like my faith in myself grew. My heart had kind of always been in harm reduction and we were like, we're gonna bring harm reduction to Georgia. We would go to a parking lot and we would sling syringes out of the back of our car. And to be able to walk into this space, it kind of feels unbelievable that we have created this. So some of these plants, it's called Swedish ivy, but it's also called a pass it on plant, right? Which I really, really like. I was given it from someone else that gave me just a start. Here with Access Point, with harm reduction, this is what we do. We get to take a little piece of hope and we get to put it in water and we get to learn how to take care of it. Y'all see those roots? You see how beautiful that is? Seriously. Like I see God in that and I don't know how else to say that. The drug culture has not always been like this. Fentanyl in the drug supply, it has completely changed everything. The overdose rates are insane. It happens in such a way that a lot of people are using substances that they're not consenting to. They're not. And what would be normal experimentation ends in casket. Last month we had someone put his head in the door and was like, I need help. And his girlfriend fell out. He didn't know what to do. And he brought her here. She needed Narcan, which is medication that reverses an opioid overdose. Had she not had that, I don't think she'd be breathing right now. It's these bittersweet feelings. Cause like, I hate what's happening. I hate this opioid crisis. I hate so much about it. But then at the same time, I'm really glad that we're here. I'm really glad that we're well established enough. I'm really glad that we have a staff, that we have volunteers, that we have the know-how that, that, um, that she's breathing. Her mom doesn't have to grieve her the way that my mom thought that she would grieve my loss.
I honestly didn't understand harm reduction. I never knew there was anything like this. It really struck a nerve with me. She started reading books and just coming out and helping in different ways. She volunteers like two hours on Fridays. That's what she commits to, but she's, she's here a fair bit. <laughs> it's kind of cute. It's so meaningful to me to feel like I can contribute in any way. Okay, so okay. technically, what are we calling this now? It's a cooker. A cooker, yeah. okay. Their substance is in here, right. right? As a mother and watching him and his life, I'm so proud of him because he's showing people with his courage not only to be alive, but you can thrive and have purpose. Now when my phone rings, I know it's Riley because I've got a ringtone for him. It's like, okay, what's happening? You know, what's going on? He's really excited. He's calling mom, telling me things. It's just such a joy. My mom and I have been through so much. There were really intense, deep hurts and deep resentments. We have had to learn how to reconnect with each other. I very much remember the first birthday card that she gave me and she called me her son, right? Like, um, I'm 68, Riley's 42, and he started shooting heroin when he was 14. It's been a long journey. Only we know, and it's like, who would have thought? Who would have thought that we would be doing this together? A lot of parents bury their kids. I am incredibly grateful that we're gonna have a different relationship with each other and that um, that we're both still here. And that's that thing too where I say that some of the people that we serve where if like, if all that we do is keep them alive, it's enough. And I really do feel that, I really do, it is enough.